we're going to begin our second Sunday back. Welcome to church today. I imagine there's those that are watching remotely as well. Would any of you uh, dare say that you had a, a really good week? And did anybody have a really good week? Okay, okay. Last night, uh, as, as a music team, we actually met off-site for three hours of just uh, going through different music, and so uh, we had uh, a good time last night. It was a bit of a sleepy time because it was warm, and we, we, uh, I kept them going on and on and on, but uh, they did so well. Um, so thankful for those that are participating up here. It's, it's, a, it's, a lot, it's more work than a person realizes. Uh, take a look at all these cables. <laughs> we could have figured out every Sunday morning where all these cables go. Oh, what a unique challenge. Well, let's pray. Let's begin. Heavenly Father, we bless you today. We're actually one week away from Father's Day. And I even prayed towards next, next week that somebody more than one would receive healing in their heart from a father wound from their past. So we thank you that you care very much for us. We're so grateful. And so, Holy Spirit, I uh, invite you to uh, be uh, prominent with your influence upon us today. Just want to push back distraction in the name of Jesus Christ, any temptation for our, our minds to wander or any kind of tech glitches this morning, we just want to uh, say enough of that and we just thank you God that you tabernacle, you, you dwell with us and so be honored here today we pray and everybody said amen. Amen. Uh, don't necessarily know all these songs like we said last week, but enjoy. Uh, hopefully one of these days the government will say, please sing in church. Okay, hopefully that comes soon. We will worship the Lamb of Glory. We're loving our King. Oh, oh, oh. we'll just tell them we're loving our King. a reason why we lift our hands. We just don't do it for no purpose. <laughs> Amen. You're allowed to hum. Yes, Renita, you're allowed to hum. <laughs> okay, social distancing regarded. Would you greet some folks this morning? Okay. Move around a bit. Say hello.
in the presence of a holy God, I bow down and I adore. You reveal the secrets of my heart, and I'm shaken to on the Lord.
new song in the beauty of holiness kind of an Irish musical feel to this song a lot of it's right out of scripture in the beauty of holiness we see you son of righteousness so we bring all that we possess to lay at your feet in the place where your glory shines jesus lover of all mankind you have drawn us with love divine to make us complete so i pause at your gates once more as my heart and my spirit soar and i wish i could love you more my god and my king is there tribute that i could bring was there ever a song to sing that could ever express my king the work that you've done could i ever conceive of this all the depths and the heights and breadth of the riches i now possess because of your in my spirit soar and I wish I could love you more my God and my King so I pause at your gates once more as my heart in my spirit soar and I wish I could love you more my God and my King let's sing verse 1 in the beauty of holiness we see you son of righteousness so we bring all that we possess to lay at your feet in the place where your glory shines jesus lover of all mankind you have drawn us with love divine to make us complete so i pause at your gates once more as my heart and my spirit soar and i wish i could love you more my god and my king is that a beautiful song i love that song you can take your seats I want to read from Acts chapter 14, verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, having won over the crowds. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day, Paul went away with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, here's the key, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. It's true. When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended the believers to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now that is raw, authentic church. Mm -hmm. And 
there's many verses in the New Testament specifically that indicate a true follower of Jesus Christ will go through suffering, tribulation, which includes suffering and trouble. We're going to sing softly and tenderly. This was a special request by Jennifer Q. Her dear husband, John, died a year ago this coming week. And these flowers she brought to commemorate that and asked if we could sing this song. Trouble does come, doesn't it? It comes in many, many forms. So let's sing softly and tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is
one more time and together let's talk it through okay don't sing but just let's talk it through okay ready I worship you almighty God mm. there is none like you I worship you oh prince Peace. That is what I long to do. I give you praise. Mm. For you are my righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I worship you. Almighty God. There is none like you. Amen. I've been encouraged by the Spirit this morning. God is with us. He's with us. He's been with us through all of this COVID <laughs> circumstance. Who, who would have ever thought we would go through something like that? But God has been faithful, hasn't he? And he will continue in the future. You know, as we're singing that song softly and tenderly, I know on one occasion when I was visiting John, he told me that that was the song that the Lord used to bring conviction to his heart that he needed a savior because he was a sinner and that Jesus was the way, the truth and the life and perhaps there's someone here this morning or someone who's watching online who has never accepted Christ as their savior like John had that occasion many many years ago and the Lord, in a soft and tender way, brought the good news of salvation to his life. Perhaps there's those that are family or friends that you're praying for, that they would come into this realization that Jesus, Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Son of the living God, the Almighty Father. We're going to pray as we come together in intercessory prayer this morning. And we're going to, I just feel led of the Spirit of the Lord to pray for those that need Christ as Savior and Lord. We're going to agree together as we pray. Father God, we come to you in and through the wonderful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. For Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you for that classic passage of scripture that many of us have grown up with for years and years. In John 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world. You loved the world, dear God. And you demonstrated your love by giving your son Jesus that whosoever believes in Christ and his work on the cross and the resurrection from the grave, that then we receive the gift of salvation the hope of eternal life and of abundance as we live. There may be some of us even here this morning who are gathered in Taylor Seminary here at Heritage Valley Assembly. There may be some who are watching by Facebook or YouTube this morning, wherever they are, gathered either here or elsewhere. 
if they've never received Christ Jesus. And Lord, you have been drawing them ever so tenderly to yourself in a soft and wonderful manner. We pray that they would just bow their heads right now, right where they are, and ask Christ into their lives. Repent of their sins and receive Jesus as Savior and the promises of of abundant life now and of eternal life to come. We pray right now that your work by your Holy Spirit would be accomplished. There are those of us that have friends and family members that we're praying for that would come to saving knowledge of Christ Jesus. And we remember them even right now in the quietness and the reverence of this moment. And we just utter their names quietly to you. And we bring them before you. And I said, your spirit will continue to draw them to yourself that they might know the great work of God in their lives. We thank you, Father. We thank you. You're the great God who created all of the universe, and yet you've chosen to live within our lives and to walk with us each day. And for that, we are so, so grateful. We are so grateful. Lord God, this morning as well, there are those that we have amongst us within our church. We know of others that are watching online this morning that are are ill of body and even of mind and spirit. And we bring them before you this morning. We remember Jerry Baker and Doug Pipke and Catherine Mebroda, Diane Key, Dan Bevan, Julie Rohr, Michelle Lindoff, Lillian Potts, Eileen Benetrude, little nine-year-old Chloe, and Benjamin. These are just some. There are others, Lord, but we bring them by name to your throne. And we would ask, Heavenly Father, that in your wonderful and sovereign way, that you would do a marvelous work within their physical bodies, and within their spirits. We pray for their families who walk with them through the times of physical challenge and we ask that you will give them a sense of strength and peace that they may be there with them as they walk through this time of trouble. Even in the time of trouble, Jesus is with us. You never leave us and you never forsake us. You are closer than the closest friend. Father, we remember those that, because of COVID-19, have lost jobs, and lost places of employment. There are some even amongst our congregation. We think of Gordon Bussey today. We think of Brian Bigham and, and Darren and Jill and Kelly and Lance. There are others. We bring them before you now, Lord. We pray that you will provide the means that they might put their hands and hearts and minds to work. Father God, we just pray for a divine intervention in providing of employment for these precious folks. We thank you for them. And what an honor it is to pray as a church family for the needs of our brothers and sisters. Lord, there are those that have lost loved ones during this period. We just continue to uplift them before you as well, Father. We continue to remember... Alice and, and uh, Frank and Marlene. And we remember Diane and Jack DeYoung and Gordon Bussey and Jennifer and her family. Lord, we hurt because of the loss of those that have left us, but we have the hope that we will see them once again. It isn't goodbye forever. It's so long until we see each other again in heaven. May, Father, even during that time of separation, may our hearts be filled with a sense of of your presence and your love and your care. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted by the hand of God himself. Lord, we remember this morning our farmers. Special request has come in, and there are farmers because of the the, the rain, and we thank you for the rain that has come. But Lord, many are not able to seed their crops because of the wet fields. And Lord God, you have all of nature in your hands. We pray for our, our beloved farmers 
We pray that they will know your blessing as you, as it were, breathe upon the fields and that you dry and prepare that soil for the seed that it might grow. Thank you, Lord God. You have everything in your hands and we trust you. We trust you completely. And so, Father, now we continue to thank you for your person and your work in our lives. You're a great and a wonderful God, and we love you today, and we give you thanks. In Jesus' wonderful name, thank you, Lord God. Oh, we're singing and playing that beautiful song. Janice, remind me, what is that song? Yeah. Yeah. There's just something about that name. I just think we should, well, we'll let's hum it. I was going to say sing it, but we'll hum it. Let's sing it together. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Let's just say his name, can we? Jesus, Jesus, we love you this morning. Thank you for being in our our presence. Thank you for honoring us with your presence this morning. We love you. There's just something about your name. We love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Oh, the sweet spirit of the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to be in his presence this morning? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, we welcomed you already this morning, but can I add my my words to that? God bless each and every one of you who have joined with us here. Isn't it wonderful to be back together again? Isn't it wonderful? Absolutely. And... uh, We want to welcome not just those of you who are here, but also those who are joining us by Facebook and by YouTube. Uh, We know that there's a number that are joining with us online, and we welcome you as well. God, God bless you. It's good to have each and every one of you. Next Sunday is Father's Day. I already got my Father's Day present. A week early, I got two sitting chairs. You know those things that you sit in? You like, uh, and uh, that my, my other one was broken. I sat in it, and I busted it. So, like, it's not supposed to happen, right? You're not supposed to bust chairs. But I guess I'm going to have to, I guess I, that's that COVID weight I put on, right? <laughs> I saw a little cartoon. Did you see it? Two people are talking to one another, and they're going, like, this is during COVID, and they look to one another, and one says, they're looking at the door and says, I wonder if I'll make it through, will you? (laughs) Well, maybe that wasn't your case. I I put on a little bit of weight uh, during that time. Well, praise God. Next Sunday, as I said, is Father's Day. And uh, I've asked if one of our fathers would uh, share the word next Sunday. And so uh, Jeff is going to share a word with us. We're looking forward to that. The following Sunday, we are going to be honoring our beautiful country of Canada. And then the following Sunday, we're going to be beginning a sermon series throughout the summer of July and August called Summer in the Psalms. 
We're going to be looking through the various psalms, and we're really looking forward to that as Pastor Matthew and, and uh, others will be sharing together. So it's going to be a great time as we come together during the summer months. I want to invite Jeff, if you would come and share a very special announcement with us, if we could at this time. I ask permission to share um, a very pressing need with the congregation this morning. It's a financial need. Uh, one of the missionaries that our church has uh, connected with strongly is uh, Romania, uh, the ministry of Peter and Haley Mrazic, uh, pastoring two churches in rural Romania. Uh, I was there twice last year. Lord willing, I'm asking him if he'll let me go this year again. Uh, so. Uh, you might remember Peter was here, I think it was in January, sharing about the ministry there. Uh, after his surgery, uh, he flew to South Africa because he has two adult uh, cousins there that are disabled, that he is the guardian for. So he needed to do uh, some business uh, administration for them. And uh, somebody graciously flew his wife and his two sons to South Africa to join them for two weeks. Then COVID hit, and South Africa government made the choice of closing things up tighter than one can almost imagine, and they got stuck. Yesterday, their older son, Kai, who's about 22 years old, managed to, uh, somebody paid for his way to get on a repatriation flight to Holland, and on Tuesday, he hopes to get back to Romania, but there's three left near Cape Town. They've been stuck there for three plus months and there's still no outlook on when they can get home, except through very expensive repatriation flights from, uh, Luft uh, from uh, KLM Airlines from uh, Holland. And so I was in Home Depot on uh, Tuesday shopping for work and I, got a phone call and it said Romania. And here was one of the leaders from the church in Romania saying, we've managed, and it's a poor church there, to scrape together 3,000 euro. He said, is there a chance you could approach your church and see if they could come up with $5,000 Canadian and collectively that would be able to pay for Peter, Haley, and their other son, Benjamin to somehow get home, because it doesn't even look necessarily like their tickets from March will even be honored by Lufthansa. It's a total unknown. So I'm presenting to you that need this morning, and so here would be the process. Donations would not be receiptable. They're not going through the church. Uh, they would be written out to Peter's wife's mother here in Edmonton, and tomorrow she would deposit those checks in their bank account so they could access the funds immediately to buy tickets. So if you uh, feel in your heart that you'd like to participate, I would really need to talk to you after the service immediately so I could tell you what to do. Thank you so much. What a circumstance, can you imagine? And uh, we were just, we wanted to make sure that we notified those of you who are here and even those of you who are online you could connect with us through heritageva at gmail, at gmail.com. And uh, we would be able, to, uh, uh, be able to process that as well. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. We trust that we can be of some help to Peter and their friend. We also had indicated that uh, we are not handing around an uh, offering plate. Uh, due to some of the uh, challenges that we face that the guidelines have been put in front of us. We're glad to uh, bring ourselves in alignment with those, uh, those uh, guidelines. However, if you're wanting to give of your tithes and offerings and worship the Lord, we do have a container at the back. And Brian, uh, just wave your hand. For those of you who don't know, he is manning that container. And if you wish to, uh, to uh, worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings this morning, uh, here, that's how you can deposit them in that container. If you're online, you can do so by going to our website, www.heritagevalleyassembly.com, and you can follow the links and you can give online as well if you desire to worship the Lord with your tithes and offerings in that regard. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Well, isn't it great that summer's here with us, finally, eh? Wasn't that a great storm last night? Don't you love storms? Anybody's basement fill up with water? No? Good. Right on. So we're in good shape, everyone. Well, as we were in that COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, sort of lockdown uh, circumstance, uh, we as a church, as you were aware, we, uh, we were so grateful that we could uh, uh, be, uh, present church online at the, uh, with, the, with the blessing of Jack and Diane DeYoung, and we want to thank them again for the uh, Living Your Purpose Coaching and Training Center where we were able to do so because we did not have access to Taylor. And so we want to say th thank you to them. Um, but we started a series because we had a number of folks asking us, what in the world is going on? <laughs> and so we wanted to address that from a biblical perspective. And for some of you who followed us, you'll know that we, uh, Pastor Matthew and I, uh, began that series. And this morning we're concluding that series. What in the world is happening? And so I invite Pastor Matthew, would you come and share the word with us at this time as we conclude this series, What in the World is Happening? God bless you, Pastor Matthew. You're probably wondering, what in the world is that? Well, how many of you have a hard time getting up out of bed? Or you're such a heavy sleeper. I know my wife is one of those heavy sleepers. I can do just about anything. I can make noise and anything. She will not get up unless I give her just a little kiss on the cheek. Then she gets up. <laughs> I don't get it, but <laughs> it works every single time. <laughs> but are you, one of those, are you one of those people where like, you just don't get out of bed? Well, there's this YouTube star by the name of Colin Furs who created a bed that will actually launch you. It actually launches you out of bed. If you do not get up in a certain amount of time, all these buzzers and bells start going off and it'll throw you. And in the video, it actually hits the wall. <laughs> and he did this as a practical, or not as a practical joke, but as a joke, of course. But since coming out, he, it's gone, the video has gone viral with 11 million views. He has had messages from people all around the world asking if he could buy, if they could buy one from him. <laughs> In the Bible, Jesus tells us a story of some people as well who fell asleep, who, uh, who, who they were waiting and waiting, and they just fell asleep. The story of the ten virgins, or the ten, ten bridesmaids. Open up your Bibles, please, to Matthew 25, 13 to 1. I'm going to go get my Bible. Matthew 25, 13, sorry, 1 to 13, 1 to 13, I said it backwards. <laughs> it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all of those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with, with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. 
What, what frightening words to hear the Lord tell you. I do not know you. That's, that's like a horror movie right there. It's scary. And it's serious. It's very sobering. Whoa. I was talking to Siri for a second. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> this is just one of the parables that Jesus gives in his Olivet Discourse about the end times. Now, for those who don't know, um, okay, so uh, Olivet Discourse is called Olivet Discourse because it ha- he taught this on the Mount of Olives. Now, for those who don't know where the Mount of Olives, let me take you there. Here we are, Heritage Valley Assembly, there's the church, and we're going to fly out of here. Okay, well, first I've got to type in the name, Mount of Olives. Notice I'm typing very slow because I don't want to mess this up because it'll look embarrassing for myself. There we go. And now here we're going to go. Skyrocketing. Bye, Canada. Bye. Here comes the Middle East. Here is Israel, Jerusalem, Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's right across from the Temple Mount. Now, as you'll see here, there is the, temp- here is the Mount of Olives. Over there is the Temple Mount, and where, where the old temple was and where the new one will be built, which we're soon be watching. And there is the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the middle there is... What David, King David called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Valley of the Shadow of Death. And this is the place where in the Old Testament people would sacrifice their children to the demonic god called Moloch. This is also the place where Jesus referred to as Gehenna, which was hell. And notice that there's no buildings there. No one wants to build there because it's known as Cursed Land. Anyways, though. Back to the virgins, back to the story of the ten virgins. That's where Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. He could clearly see the Temple Mount, see the temple, the, maje- the, the, the majestic temple there. Now with Jesus teaching on, uh, at this very place on, on the Mount of Olives, it's very poignant because this is the exact place where he will soon be taken up to heaven. As Luke 24:31 tells us, and also Acts 1, 1 to 11. It's also the very same place where he will come back. We are waiting for this. It hasn't happened yet. Jesus is coming back in his second advent, his second coming, where, where Zechariah 14, 4 tells us that his feet will land on the Mount of Olives and it will suddenly split right down the center and create a wide valley. This is going to happen. It's incredible. I, I mean... It would be incredible to see. Now, it's important to note that right before this parable that Jesus gives, uh, as he tells his disciples, he tells them that no one will know when the Son of Man will come. No one will know when Jesus comes back. They will not know the, the time. They won't know the hour. They won't know. It will be unexpected. He even tells us that it, that it will be like how it was back in the time in, in Noah's day. That in Noah's day... Everyone was given into marriage and, you know, and, and just, you know, living happily. And they were not heeding the words of, of Noah that there was a judgment coming. They were not listening to him until everyone was swept away by the flood in judgment. Two will be working in a field, as Christ says, and suddenly one of them will be swept away in judgment, just like in Noah's time. So then Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 44, he says, Therefore, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Have you ever waited for someone, and they're supposed to be there at a certain time, and you're waiting, and waiting, and waiting, and you're looking at your clock like, Oh my goodness, where are they? And you and try to text him, like, where are you, dude? Where are you? You're supposed to be here by now. I'm supposed to pick you up. Or, you know, and, like, and you're waiting and waiting. And sometimes, uh, do you ever get that thing that comes upon you where suddenly uh, a little, little, little Sandman comes by and he starts to you know, do his, his stuff on you and you, you fall asleep and you, you get zonked? <laughs> you, you, yeah, um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get sleepy when that happens. Sandman comes by and I go to sleep. Now, you may ask, though, um, about these ten virgins. Who are these ten virgins that all fall asleep? All of them fall asleep. Now, who are they? These virgins 
were actually bridesmaids ready for the wedding. And that was the custom of the day. Bridesmaids had to be unmarried girls. Now, why 10? Why that number? Well, the Jewish historian Josephus tells us that in that day, 10 was the number of completeness for the Jews. You needed 10 to establish a synagogue. You also needed the minimum of 10 to celebrate the Passover. And you also needed 10 to, to, uh, to, to establish an official blessing upon the groom. Now, what about those lamps that they had? Well, the Greek word for the lamps is lampus. This is the same word that's actually used when the guards come to, come to the garden where Jesus is there praying, and they come to arrest him. And it says that the guards had lampus in their hands, which were torches. So it can be used torches, hand lamps, like in the picture there. And actually, these torches or, or, or hand lamps... Um, whatever they were, um, they, 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 when the bridesmaids carried these, it was, you know, we, we think, okay, yeah, these were important to light their way. Yes, true, they were important to light their way, but there's another thing as well that they were important for, for the purpose of having these lamps. It was to identify your face when you came up to the door to enter in to the party, to the wedding feast. There was a person, there would be a person at the door checking off the list, are you invited to the wedding? to the wedding party, and so you would probably identify yourself with the torch or the lamp, and so there your face would be shone, because there was no street lights back in the day. Remember, this is 2,000 years ago, and so it would be dark. But without, without this lamp, you cannot identify yourself. You cannot properly identify yourself. These bridesmaids, these ten, these ten bridesmaids who are virgins represent Christian believers, or Christians, I should say, actually. The lamp represents one's true salvation in Christ. Now, this is the scary thing. Ten bridesmaids who all looked alike, but only half of them were ready, were ready for Christ to come. They all looked ready, but only half of them had the thing that they needed, oil. John MacArthur in his commentary on Matthew 24, chapters 24 to 28, says this about the ten virgins. He says, They carried torches that looked exactly like those of the others, uh, but, they, but they had nothing to burn with them, nothing that would give light and significance. A torch without fuel is obviously worthless, and a profession of faith in, in Jesus Christ without a saving relationship to him is infinitely more worthless because one is left in spiritual darkness. This is quite sobering when you read this and study it. Oftentimes we just read it, but we don't, we don't know the understanding. We don't know what it means. But once we have an understanding, it's quite sobering because we all realize that not all the bridesmaids were actually saved. Symbolically speaking, of course. Because this is a parable. And these bridesmaids represent people who take on the title of being a Christian and attending church. The ones who do not have the oil. That's scary because it's, it's saying that half of everyone who calls themselves a Christian is not going to heaven. Whoa. The other bridesmaids who had oil were prepared for the second coming of Christ. They had salvation. They had repented of their sins and made a commitment to serve Christ and to follow him, and hence receiving salvation. This message that Jesus gives is pretty sobering. And so I am here to say this morning that calling yourself a Christian will not save you. Using that title will not save you. Attending church will not save you. Being baptized will not save you. Taking communion will not save you. And if you're, especially if you do not know Christ and you're taking communion, you're in danger of judgment. You must be a Christian and right in heart, as Paul talks about, in order to take communion. Being a Christian is not just a title that one wears or a little patch that they have, or a hat that they have on and look cool and hip. No, it's a lifestyle. 
Not just a lifestyle, but a radical lifestyle contrary to what the world believes and thinks and does. Many people today like to call themselves a Christian, but they will not count the cost of being a Christian. There is a cost to following Christ. And those in persecuted countries like China and uh, Pakistan and other places, they understand that. They get the cost. But here, here in North America, we don't really get that. A lot of people don't understand that, that there comes a cost following Christ. In other words, if you follow Christ, are you actually, are you actually serious enough that you would actually give your life for Christ? Would you be ready if the time came, if a gunman came in to this place or to a school and started going over to every single person, pointing their gun, and asking if you were a Christian, or, or, or saying if, if you believed in Jesus, or something like that, would you have the guts to say, yes, I am? Many people say that they are Christian, but they act like the devil in the world. And others take the title and try to pretend like a Christian. And when the storms rage and the fires come, nothing is left. They are exposed because their life was not actually built on the solid foundation of God's word. It meant nothing. It was worthless. Without God, you will not be able to stand the heat when it comes. Taking on the title of a Christian... And sinning like the devil is like a person who builds their house out of paper mache. Looks kind of cool. Looks pretty cool, especially when you paint it up and everything. You can do cool little things with it. But once the rain comes or a strong wind comes, it melts. It, it, it falls apart. It's blown over. It's exposed. A person who takes on the title of a, of a Christian and goes to church and attends church things and even talks Christian lingo. Uh, but is not actually saved. He is like a person who built his house with no insulation in the walls and built his house on a very, very weak foundation underneath. On the outside, looks great. You can see, yeah, there's a, there's a foundation under the house, but no one knows that it's, it's actually terribly weak. It's not actually th the real thing. As long as temperatures stay nice, it doesn't get too cold because you got no insulation and it doesn't get too hot, and as long as it doesn't rain too much, you'd be okay. But over time, cracks would start to form because the foundation is slowly moving. Cracks would form in the walls, and so you try to take out your mudding and you try to paint it up, sand, or sand it, of course, you got to sand it, and then you paint it, and then no one knows. You try to hide it up like that. But when the winters come, the cold weather comes in, and you got no insulation, nothing to protect you. And then when the spring comes, all the melting, all the snow and everything, it all melts, all the water, suddenly your foundation sinks and your house looks like this. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> or like this one. These are, I, I looked these up. These are actual photos of people who do not have strong, strong foundations. And this is what will happen. In other words, you never built your faith in Christ. You never built your life on his word, which was the foundation in the story. And also, you never prayed. You never, you, pray, you never prayed and actually meant it from your heart. You never meditated on scripture, which would be the insulation in the story. The only thing that will save you is to do what Acts 16:31 says, believe in the Lord, Lord believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Hallelujah. But what does that mean? What does it mean to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then you shall be saved? To believe in Jesus means to believe everything that he said and did. That it was it's I like how people say, gospel, gospel truth. Yeah, that it, it's truth. That there's no wrong to it. Which means that you believe in his death and resurrection, that he's alive today. You believe in his words. And you take his words literally. You take them and you, you apply them to your life and to things around you. 
So you believe them. By believing them, you also then come to humbling yourself and recognizing that you are a sinner and that only Jesus can cleanse you and save you. And then you also, by doing this, you are obeying him. By doing this, you are saved. By doing these things, there is salvation. Because as Martin Luther realized back in the 1500s, that salvation is not done by works. It's by, but it's by faith. Salvation is through faith alone in Christ Jesus, not through works. Am I out? I was kind of, well, I was kind of wondering that. Thank you. Salvation is through is through faith alone in Christ Jesus. This is what Martin Luther realized. What's that? I think you're good again. Oh, am I, am I good again? Okay. Okie dokie. How's that? Good, good, good. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, and, he, and Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. Do you catch that? It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's through faith alone in Christ Jesus that will save you. You hear that, church? Through faith alone, not works. But as James, of course, teaches in the book of James, that when one receives salvation through faith alone, that works naturally comes out of the person. Like like, uh, a fruit with Coming, uh, blossoming on a tree, like an apple tree. Like right now in my backyard, there are buds starting to form, and there, there's, there's, there's al- little baby apples forming, just like that. Greatest revivalist said this. I love this. This is one of my favorite uh, revivalists back in the 1700s, Francis Asbury, who was a circuit rider. And he once said this. I'll, I'm going to read it twice because it's sometimes hard to get. You should so work as if you were to be saved by works and so rely on Jesus Christ as if we did no works. Let me read that again. We should so work as if we were to be saved by our works and so rely on Jesus Christ as if we do no works. Notice, though, with the story of the ten virgins that the bridegroom, which is Jesus, is delayed in his coming. He was delayed, and so they're waiting. And like I said, when someone is delayed, you tend to get tired and get a little sleepy as the Sandman comes by. You notice that both groups fall asleep, not just the non-Christians, but the Christians as well. Both groups, all of them, all bridesmaids, all virgins, fall asleep. Now the problem with falling asleep is, if you fall asleep... Oh, brother, you better make sure that you're ready and you got your things packed. You're ready to go as soon as, as, soon as, uh, as, soon as the person arrives. You've got to make sure you're ready. I know many times um, growing up, and, um, uh, my, my dad would often tell me, okay, we're going to be going to the uh, uh, restaurant in, 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 in a um, few uh, moments, but you know, m- mom is just in the bathroom putting on makeup, stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, okay, you know, I'll, I'll wait. To, you know, n- no, no rush yet. So I'll sit and do, you know, like, do some stuff on my computer, you know, whatever. And, and then also my dad comes by, like, okay, it's time to go. Oh, nuts, I didn't, oh, man, I'm not actually ready. I got to change my clothes and, you know, man. <laughs> Another thing, too, I thought of. When I, was, when I was a kid in the 90s, my family and I um, had a wonderful vacation at Disneyland. And so we were there at the LAX airport. We were just leaving Disneyland. So we're at LAX. We're going to fly home. And we, we get in, you know, to the, to the um, uh, uh, ter, 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 terminal, and we, we see our gate number. We're like, ah, the gate's way down there, but we got lots of time. We got three hours to spare. So we sit down. We, 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 we uh, uh, park ourselves, and my dad takes out the video camera, the old camcorder, you know, those big things, and sometimes they would rest on your shoulder, you know. So, you know, as you take out the camcorder, and we start watching videos. We're like, oh, yeah, this is nice. We just did this yesterday, two days ago, you know. <laughs> Sounds kind of dorky when I think about it. And in the background, and meanwhile, in the background, we kept hearing, Pike, family of four, please come to gate such and such immediately. And it kept going on. And then by the third time, my dad was like, Pike, Pimpke, that's us. Let's go. And so right away, um, my mom and I went running down to the gate. We're rushing. And um, 
And, and my, we mean, meanwhile, my dad and my sister are putting away the, cam, the, the, the camcorder and everything. They're packing up. So we, 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 we book it, man. I mean, like, we get down there. We get to the gate. We're a Russian get, just to get down there. We're not Russian. We're actually German. But we're, we're a Russian just to get down there. <laughs> and we get to the gate. And it was just about to close. We barely made it. The worst thing is trying to get on the or getting on the plane and looking at all of those faces staring at you. Oh my goodness! Oh my father! I tell you, you know, like all those faces, those eyes. If, only, if they were all Superman, they would shoot laser beams through you. It was that. It was that bad. But like, yeah, like talk talk about hashtag awkward, hashtag embarrassing. Oh, when the bridegroom finally arrived, um, everyone woke up. Everyone woke up when the announcement was called. Here, here is the bridegroom. They all woke up. The true believers and the non-believers woke up. But suddenly, the non-believers realized that they were not truly ready. It was too late. And so it will be when Jesus comes back. It will be too late for you if you are not ready by then. I often get quite annoyed when I hear people saying, Oh, Jesus probably won't come back for another thousand years. <laughs> it's cute. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I guess like one percent it could be true, but uh, the main thing that re- the reason why it really annoys me is because it's the wrong way of thinking. In scriptures, time and time again, we read about and see how people expected Jesus to come back so soon in their lifetime, actually. And I've heard others say that, oh, so-and-so, he was a dear brother serving the Lord, and he truly believed that Jesus was coming back in his lifetime, but he didn't. Hmm. And I know what they're getting at when they say that, as in, like, he didn't come back in his lifetime, so he probably won't come back in mine either. Wrong way of thinking. And, 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 I, I, you know, and they sometimes start to question whether the apostles, and I've heard this before, whether, you're apost- whether the apostles and the early church followers, whether they were wrong or not. Because they expected Jesus to come back in their time. And I, I've heard someone tell me, like, wow, I, I guess Paul was wrong, huh? Thinking that Jesus was coming back in his lifetime. No, he wasn't wrong. First off, when we see that, we have to look at what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through His Word when we read of those expectations. It is a mistake to think that the early church in the New Testament was wrong in this kind of thinking. That's wrong to think that. The Word of God is showing us that we must live our lives in constant awareness and expectancy and readiness because Jesus very well could come back in your lifetime. And so we must live and act with expectancy that Jesus is coming back in our lifetime, your lifetime, my lifetime. Why am I stressing the importance of this? Let's say we have three people that are named Bob. And so they're all named Bob. They're the exact same person. They have the exact same life, the exact same job, wife, kids, you know, so on and so on. Um, and they're all, they're all identical. It's like almost like the twilight zone a bit here. Now, let's say that all of these three Bobs come to faith in Christ Jesus. They believe in Christ. They've come to salvation. But Bob, number one, is not really taught at all on the second coming of Christ. In fact, he doesn't know much about it because his pastor rarely preaches or talks about it. Bob, number two, knows a fair bit about the end times, but Bob is taught by his pastor that Jesus is coming back sometime down the road, and it probably won't be for another 100, 500, maybe even 1,000 years. In other words, he is taught to not live in in the expectancy of the second coming of Christ. The third Bob knows a lot about the second coming, or quite a fair bit about the second coming, because his pastor taught him well, and he also studied on on it as well. And he was taught to live in constant awareness and expectancy of Christ's second coming. Now, I guarantee you that the first two Bobs in this relationship, their their relationship with Christ is almost identical. But the third Bob, I guarantee you that his, his relationship with Christ will be more on fire and will be 
striving to live a life of holiness and purity before the Lord. Because if you are living in constant awareness and expectancy of Christ's second coming, then you will naturally strive to know Jesus more, to pursue Him more, and to make sure you're living a holy life and open to conviction when the Holy Spirit convicts you. This small key knowledge that Jesus is, can come back at any time will change any person's relationship with Christ. It will intensify his relationship with Christ. Draw him closer. If we know that Jesus is coming back and that there will be a great judgment upon this world with terrible calamities like this world has never, ever seen before, and that all of those who do, not, who, do not, who do not have Christ living inside of them, who do not have an actual salvation with Christ, will be in hell, burning for eternity. And in and, and eternity, we often you know, think like eternity, oh yeah, that's hard to imagine. Well, think of, think of your lifetime uh, times, like you say uh, you lived up to 85. Think of 85 times, a thousand 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 times. Never ending, in torment. Knowing this types of this type of information ought to cause some change in you. This is why Peter says, in Second Peter three eleven, he says, "But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, when the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved." And the earth and its works that all that are, that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Having this knowledge and readiness that Jesus could truly come back any day, you start to ask yourself, am I ready? Am I truly ready? If you found out you had cancer and you only had a year to live, your natural instinct would be, well, I'm going to take the family on a vacation maybe. You know, maybe go to Hawaii or Europe or I don't know. And you would start to do other things. You would change your life drastically. You would, uh, you would probably start to make, um, uh, um, you know, friends that had wrongs against you or you had wrongs against you. You would try to make them right again. You would try to make relationships right. Everything right you could you would change your life. In the same way, when one knows that Jesus can truly come back at any moment, their lifestyle also changes. And this knowledge creates holiness in one's life. After all, you would not, be, you would not want to be doing something that you shouldn't be doing, something sinful, and then suddenly Jesus comes back. Oh, boy. I, when I first heard that a number of years ago, it, it, I think it was A.W. Tozer that, that said that, and it just it rocked me to the core. It convicted me so much. If you, and I actually, on a side note, that was actually one of the mo main motivations that actually, actually kept me out of pornography and, uh, and, and my other sins of the past. That was actually the main thing that, that one, of the, one of the main things that helped me to stop was I realized Jesus could come back at any moment when I'm doing this. If Jesus comes back, are you going to say, nuts, I should have done this, I should have done that today and earlier this week? Oh. Or, or would you say something like, I, I should have done more for the cause of Christ. I should have done more for Jesus. I should have witnessed to my friend. Will you regret it? Just like the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids who all fell asleep, I believe today many Christians are falling asleep. We're starting to get lulled. We're starting to fall asleep because we're waiting so long. And we start to think, oh, boy, when is Jesus coming? Remember what Second Peter talks about? I brought this up a couple weeks ago on my, in my other sermon. Actually, I think it was at the beginning of this uh, series on uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, or, four, or chapter 4, forgive me, where he says that for one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day, showing that God is patient. That's the whole context of that scripture, that Jesus, or that God is patient. He's waiting. 
I believe it's getting pretty close to midnight. Believers are falling asleep. We're all starting to fall asleep. I think it's, yeah, I think it's getting pretty close to midnight. Midnight has always been symbolic of physical and spiritual darkness. Tradition tells us that Jesus was born at midnight. Just think about it. When Jesus was born at midnight, it was, it was dark. People were sleeping. In the same way as well, they were also not expecting him. They waited for 400 years. There was not a, there was not a uh, voice from God for 400 years. And he came out of the blue. At least expected it. And so it will be the same way when Jesus comes back in his second coming. We will least expect it. We will think, oh, he'll probably come you know, around this sort of time. Nope, he's going to come at that time. You know? It just shows we've got to be ready. Yes, we see the signs happening around us. Um, scientists prove that hurricanes are actually getting worse and worse. They're building up more energy as, as the years go on. And other sort of calamities, they're getting worse. More various earthquakes around the world. And, and calamities, riots. It's going on right now. And these are all, as what Jesus talks about, as uh, birth pains. And you, you notice that soon the baby's about to be born when all the birth pains start, you know, and, they, and then more and more, you know. But for some of us, it will be too late. When suddenly the trumpet will sound and Jesus will descend from heaven with the voice of an archangel and we will be caught up with him in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Are you ready? Are you ready? Maybe everyone here is ready. I don't know. But what about the viewers on Facebook or the viewers on YouTube? Are you ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh God, Lord, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, Almighty God, and we ask for Thy blessings upon us, our church, and our country, Lord. Lord, awaken us. Sorry about the audio being cut out there. Uh, that was that was a that was a technical uh, difficulty. That's a great example of a technical difficulty right there. <laughs> and it was just noticed now as I was editing the video um, or editing the uh, sermon and came across it. I was like, "What just happened?" <laughs> so my apologies for that. Um, well, you know what? Um, why don't I why don't I pray uh, for the closing of the service and I'll. Just continue my prayer, I guess, here, and um, <clears throat> and then I'll go into the sinner's prayer. Because Pastor Larry, uh, later on, Pastor Larry comes up and prays the sinner's prayer. So I'll just finish off what I was praying. And, and uh, I mean, I can't remember exactly, but I'll just go along with it. And, uh, and I'll just pray, and then I'll pray the sinner's prayer then, okay? Father God, I just pray, Lord, God, that you would... You would stir up people's hearts, Lord. God, if there's anyone who does not know you or anyone who, who is not sure of uh, if they are saved or not, Father, I pray that you would shake them, Lord, where they are, whether you would convict them in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, that you draw them to you, Lord, and that they would feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and, 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 and just they would feel the tender touch of you, Lord, the tender touch of your presence, of your peace, of your comfort, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray, awaken our churches, Lord. Stir us up, Lord, for you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Draw us closer to you, we pray. And Lord, for all, all, of, all of us who, who are believers, I pray, God, that God, you would strengthen us. Strengthen us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let me let me pray the sinner's prayer. If there's somebody who's watching and you do not know Christ, or you're not exactly sure if you do know Christ, and like I said, if Jesus came back, um, you know, at the end of this or, or later today or later this week, 
would you be going to heaven or not? Or would you be going to hell? It's a very serious thing. And, and if you do not know, and you are feeling the Holy Spirit prompting you, you're kind of like feeling like your heart is racing a little bit or something like that, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner and that I need cleaning. Clean me, Lord. Wash away my sins. Jesus, I believe that you died on, on the cross for my sins. And that you rose from the grave. And are alive today. I ask you now, Lord, to lead me. To cleanse me. And make me whole. Father, draw me closer to you. And Lord, I pray that in these, in, 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 in that, 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 and Lord, I pray that, that you would, you would fill me with the Holy Ghost. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. That's the first time that you prayed that prayer. I, I, I invite you, please. Uh, send a message, comment, or, or somehow let us know, because this is a joyous thing. When one comes to Christ, when one comes and, and, and receives salvation from Jesus and repents of their sins, then it says in Scripture that all of heaven rejoices. It's a wonderful thing. It's a party. So please send us a message. And now, God bless you, and have a wonderful week. And may the Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and may His face shine upon you. God bless you. Bye-bye.